Okay, João do Luca, how are you, my friend? Amazing, man. Thank you for having me here. It's a what an honor. Thank you. I appreciate it. Listen, we we did try this before. We had some sound issues, so we came back to it, and the uh, picture looks beautiful. Sound sounds amazing. So glad to have you. Good, ready to go, man. That's awesome. So where are you coming from? Where where are you right now? I am in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, in the middle of the the country, and. I've been here about two months now, and I had my baby daughter in Brazil, and now we're setting up here as a family, and yeah, well, things are looking good here. Well, that's interesting. So, obviously, you're Brazilian, your wife's Brazilian. Why did you, but you've been living in America for many years, why did you decide to go home and have the baby in Brazil? Uh, first, it was, a, the initial plan, we, we, we were planning to have the, Kira here, so uh, whenever we would do the documents, uh, you wouldn't have much problem, like she would be an American, but mm -hmm. looking back, it was the best decision. Uh, going back to our roots, we're both Brazilian, and uh, we wanted to be close to our family, and we wanted to, for her to sort of have a similar background than we had, and uh, have the same roots, and uh, it was, at, at the end, it was the best thing, because the all the, we, we found one uh, maternity house where it was good, where it was good enough, but uh, it was still felt like it wasn't, we, we didn't get the quite the warm, quite the, the, the attention that we were looking for, kind of like what we would have in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, things was very like practical. And uh, we, we would go, we go there, see a doctor, and then she would say like, everything is fine. But uh, we never felt like, sort of a connection there. And then going back to Brazil, immediately the first doctor visit before Kiro was born, it was just so wow. So it was like, yeah, this is, this is what I wanted. This is, this is the love that I was looking for, getting the answers, not just being practical for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you see the visit and then do all the check marks and then boom, you're done, whoever's next. Uh, I felt like everything down there was a lot more, you had a connection and uh, they were explaining a lot of the things, even things, uh, some of the things that we're not even asking. Uh, and uh, so we, we, we felt it was a love and first sight, I would say there going back mm -hmm. to Brazil. And uh, obviously we knew we would be hard having the, the first kid on our own. So it was a, it was the best decision going down yeah. to Brazil to have family support, to be, you know, uh, people who you love. Even though we have a lot of people that who feel have a great connection here in Louisville, we have friends, we have coaches, you have Carol's bosses and they're, they're great, but uh, it's it's not the same as the family. And, yeah. uh, and then this whole crazy thing happened. Uh, the pandemic start right after Kira was born and very lucky, very glad that we had her there because if you had her here, we wouldn't be able to travel down there mm. or neither have family come up to see her. So we, the initial plan was to stay four months until Brazil trials, but we ended up staying almost nine months in Brazil. And wow. uh, it was, it was, it was really good for, for me. It was such a good time, nice. even though this, this whole craziness happening in the world inside my bubble inside my house uh it was the best thing i was uh i'll was, I was say the being the best years of my life so far. <laughs> yeah it's crazy <laughs> uh, most people don't look at it that way but for you you know first time dad um going home and experiencing that with family and friends and then coming back and, and starting your life in america it's uh it's been a good year for you, man. So that's interesting. But uh, we, we do have a lot of in common. We have a lot of connection ourselves. Um, not only was I a coach on the Brazilian team while you were a swimmer, but my, my first daughter, her name is Kira as well. Um, and then a lot of people may not know this, but your wife, Carol, was the designer of my logo back here. So yeah, uh, pretty cool, man. She did a great job there. She did. A, it's looking really sharp. It's she she did a fantastic job. I'm so happy and so proud. Yeah. Of that. Um, but like, listen, man, you just announced your retirement this year as well, just recently. Why did you decide to call it quits Not now? Uh, it was, uh, 
life changes. You know that uh, when once you become a father, uh, life changes. At least for me, it was changed for the best, and uh, a whole version of myself reborn. I, the, the new Joao had to born again with new responsibilities, with new things, and new goals. And lately, all the the goals that I had as an athlete, it was my personal goals. It was my things that I wanted to achieve. Uh, things I envisioned as was where I wanted to be, where I wanted to get as an athlete. But uh, the moment she was born, the day after, uh, it just life does change big time. I will put myself, my life in front of anything to protect this little girl and my family. So uh, it was mainly for a family. It was, you know, I wanted to be close to her and uh, it was a lot of things happening all at once. First, uh, Kira was born. Second, uh, the pandemic started. All the pools closed and uh, I had nowhere to train. And then third, after a week not being able to train, I went down surfing uh, at, in Rio and I ended up injuring myself. I tore my knee. I I tore my PCL, my MCL, mm. and I pulled my hamstring. Mm. So at that at that moment, they hadn't postponed the Olympics yet, and in my mind, it was it was already like I'm not going. It's uh, there's no way I'm gonna be able to train and be good enough to to compete in less than a few months. And uh, so that. that Uh, I would say initially last recovery. Good. I'm doing everything I was doing before, and um, but mainly it was the decision to stay with my family and not travel as much, give all the attention that I can to Kira, and and yeah, try to. Uh, we want to. I want to have a common goal with my wife and my 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 daughter, something we can grow as a family instead of just put myself first like i've always been doing for 30 years yeah uh yeah, and sense. no longer no longer uh mass for the family yeah getting the the olympic medals a lot of things would change financially uh you know a lot more doors will open but technically i've i'm happy with everything i've accomplished uh I think overall, I've accomplished everything I could from swimming. I got a great scholarship. Uh, I have I had a really good education. I I travel all around the world. I connect with a lot of people. And the only thing was missing it was it was the Olympic medal. That was the only thing that kept me going to to try for the another Olympics. And I know the chances to get it, they're very little. And the sacrifice they had to put into it's. Tremendous! You have to literally sacrifice a lot of things, and right now, I'm not willing to sacrifice time with my family to to get the only thing I didn't get as an athlete. Uh, now, nice. go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, there's so many lessons learned over a period of of a career like that, and and I know that you've had time to reflect on some of those things you learned about being a professional swimmer, or you know, just uh, being an athlete growing up in Brazil and then taking a college scholarship in America. There's so many things you've learned along the way. So tell us some of the lessons that maybe you'll pass on to your future swimmers now that you're a coach or even to your daughter, things that you learned through swimming that uh, are important life lessons. Uh, I'll say definitely. Yeah, I learned this. Uh, I had this idea, you know, when even though I was still in Brazil, I knew that the possibilities are the, I'll say the, the university that is the sport, you can teach you a lot of lessons. And mm -hmm. I think one of the lessons I learned the most so is uh, how to win and most important, how to lose and keep my head up to, for the next, what's next. And, uh, and one thing also later on in my career, one thing that I, it was, it was very, very helpful for me to learn was to not judge myself. 
uh, either good or bad. Things sometimes are the way they are. And, uh, you know, a lot of times as an athlete, sometimes you put yourself like you don't hit the times that you, you, you're looking for. And immediately, first thing you say is like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm so stupid. I'm so slow. I'm so, you know, you get caught in those uh, labels mm. that, uh, that uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't push you forward. And then, you know, as a swimmer, we're fighting for, for one one hundred of a second. And sometimes just one thought that crossed your, your mind, it can make a total difference between winning and losing, making or not, or, you know, changing your life or not and uh so definitely not 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 judging was one big thing that 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 he taught me and uh definitely winning and losing and uh be able to stay humble no matter what you gotta stay humble no matter how it doesn't matter how good you are and you have to stay humble and later on in my career a great lesson that i i learned obviously by getting so much throughout swimming uh you have to give it back to and uh mm-hmm. you have to you cannot just keep it all to yourself and be selfish you have to i mean at least that was the, that's the obligation i felt like mm-hmm. towards the end of my career i felt like i had a I, I, I had a need to give back yeah yeah uh we're very similar in that sense i think i've i've felt the same way throughout my career i felt like so many people gave me so many valuable lessons and i learned so many things that i always felt this need to give back in any way that i could and this podcast in a way is kind of an outlet for me to be able to share stories like you but it it enables me to give back to the sport too so whatever the avenue is i always felt a draw to swimming and i know you're very similar in that sense you you and i have very close personalities when it comes to those sorts of things. Tell me, uh, you're, you're a coach, you're a young coach now, you're going into coaching. Who's somebody in your life, a coach that's had a major impact on you and, and why, how, how have they done that? I had uh, one coach back at home growing up. Uh, his name is Daniel Volokita. Mm-hmm. Uh, and right now he's, uh, he's living in Israel with his family. And uh, for me, growing up, he was, uh, I had so much admiration for him. He was sort of like, he, he was a father, a father figure for me as well, because he was always supporting me no matter what. And he was sort of like my dad. He, he's, he was never raised his voice. He always speak, uh, very, very clear and very, um, sometimes very intense. And uh, you had that like connection, like eye and eye. So you like stare at my, dip in my eye and say something that sometimes it was mean, but you at the time was, you would make total sense. Like I remember one time and uh, I was killing, I was killing it at the set. And uh, he, know, he knew that I, I, I could have done better. And then at some point I was just like, I was just joking around, like acting like I was the best. And he immediately just shut me down. He's like, you think you're, you're good enough? You think you're good enough? And uh, obviously, I could have taken it both ways. Either like, oh, he doesn't believe I'm good. But I felt like at that moment, he made such a – he was so impactful because I knew that I could have gone way, way farther. And uh, that was not it. I was mm. – I would not settle. So uh, he was – he was the guy that opened doors for me as far as like – you can achieve your dream. You can go after. And uh, so uh, he trained me until I was 18, I think. Mm. Uh, and he was a great guy. I mean, he's, he's a guy I really respect. And later I came to, to the U.S. Uh, and Arthur became this figure for me, uh, very close. Uh, we, you know, he helped me so much throughout all the journey. Arthur but, Albiero. Uh, Arthur Albiero. Yeah, that's right. And uh, we had a great journey and we all, we had up and downs. Uh, you know, he, he trusts me a lot as an athlete and uh, he put me at some spots that I quite didn't feel uh, comfortable with it. I remember, you know, after winning my first NCAA champion, uh, he put me as a captain and, uh it was something I, I, what I didn't want to do. I didn't want it to, to be in that position, the highlight position. I was always, you know, I knew I was a good swimmer, but I never felt like 
I was in a position there like to lead the group. And that for me was such an amazing experience because swimming, it changed from, from individual. And it was uh, in college already, it was from individual to team. But once he put me in the, the spot as a captain, it was just a tremendous change. Like a lot of the things said that I wouldn't do, like, like recruiting, you know, give attention to the recruits. I felt obligated to do it. I felt like I had to give, I have to push, I have to uh, to push people to get better. I have to bring some, of, you know, help bring some of the athletes to mm -hmm. join the U of L team and all that. And another coach that for me was, it's and it still is. Uh, it's a great friend of mine, and uh, I love him so much. It's Chris Lindauer. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a lot of the times. He was he was more like we were more like level. We could speak the same things, and uh, he would understand me. Uh, so I was never I would never hold anything back to to tell him or or you know just he was the guy that all he will always keep me accountable no matter what, and uh, he would always get me out of my comfort zone. Uh, he knew my weakness and he knew some of the, my, my, my strength. And he obviously pushed my weakness and try to just cut the bullshit from me. It was like, hey, no. One of the things that I always struggled with was not keep my stroke uh, without breathing. And uh, he was he was the only one that said such a things that like you would make me different like in my mind to like, okay, I'm going to listen to this guy. He's right. And uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and one more coach that was uh, great for me he was uh, now he's coaching in Minas. Uh, I was there last year, uh, Sergio. Uh, he was um, he was a great mentor as well. Uh, very different team player than uh, any other coaches I've seen in Brazil. So we had this great connection. I, I, even though we didn't work for very long, we worked about uh, six months. We had a great connection, and uh, you know, uh, it was it was such an amazing experience uh, to train with him. It's nice when you have people like that throughout your career that have made a huge impact on you. Um, you, you know, you you certainly talked talked about some instances where the coaches have challenged you, and you've had to then look internally, uh, maybe really quickly, or you, they give you a, a couple of hours or a couple of days to figure it out, or or maybe even it took you a season to think oh yeah that's what they were talking about but um you know you see it all the time that athletes take things personally when a coach is pushing them or challenging them um you know have you seen that in your own experiences and why do you think that you may have been different to some of your teammates when when some people take things very very personal you got a problem here sorry all right, yeah, we had some uh, slight interruptions there. But uh, in terms of the question about, you know, some athletes take things personally from their coaches and, and you seem to take it in the way that they meant it of like challenging you and pushing you. Uh, have you seen that from people around you? And how do you try and encourage those people when they do take things personally from a coach, when, when the coach is actually just trying to send a message to them of, hey, you can be better here? Well, one thing that uh, I've always seen, and especially as grow as I got more mature as an athlete, uh, is uh, before, like, okay, let me go back a little bit. Uh, before growing up, I always we always had that like mentality or a vision that coach is your boss. They they gonna tell you what to do. You have to do it no matter what. He's always gonna be right. Uh, you cannot argue to that. And uh, and obviously, as I get more mature, as I got you know, more experience as well. I start, I start seeing the sport and the relationship coach and athlete are more like a partnership. And, uh, mm. and uh, you know, and it's, it's not, he's not my boss. He's not, he's, he won't be total every time right. And uh, you have to make a really good connection with the coach and maintain a good communication where you can, give give feedback and mm -hmm. explain some of the things that you feel because the coach is just is just an eye obviously with a lot of experience but coaches do not understand how we how athletes feel like unless mm -hmm. the athletes if it's very well communicating giving feedback mm -hmm. and uh so 
And now as a coach, it's something, it's one of the things I worked a lot, even though I'm coaching younger ones, I try to be clear. I try to just, uh, you know, uh, make them understand that I'm not their boss. I'm, I'm their partner and their success. Obviously it's my success. And, uh, I'm their number one fan. And I'm, I'm the one probably that want them to succeed mo more than anybody, uh, obviously, and their parents too. But uh, if we may, I think if, if it's clear for both and to have an understanding that it's a partnership, I think you just get a lot easier. So it's right now as, an, as a coach, it's something that I try to be straightforward with my athletes and tell them that in, uh, this is – not every time I'm going to be 100% right. Uh, I have a great understanding of swimming. I have good knowledge, but uh, I need to get your feedback to, to have an understanding of what's going on in your mind and your, how you're physically feeling, emotionally, spiritually, and all that, because all these things depend so, so much in order to achieve success. Yeah, well said, man. I like that. Very good advice there for young athletes. Now, listen, uh, let's talk about a couple of your performances a little bit. Uh, one of the most incredible performances I saw was when you won the 200 freestyle at NCAAs from lane one. Uh, I could really just see the mentality that you had behind the blocks and that translated from the very first stroke. I mean, you were, I like the word intentional. You were very intentional in terms of the way that you were going to swim that race, how you were going to swim it, the... Um, the confidence you had in your ability to, to swim the way you swam, but it was really just, this is my race and I'm going to go get it. So talk, talk to me about that performance you had on that particular day. Yeah. Um, in order to talk about that, I have to start the year before my sophomore year. Uh, I had all, I, throughout all the season going to dual meets, I had the fastest time and, and, uh, but going to the meet, going to NCAAs, I wasn't mentally prepared for that. I was sort of out of my head thinking that I was the best, that it was one, and I just had to just swim and sort of the victory fall off my lap. Mm -hmm. And I ended up being third. And uh, that really stank. That, like, it was hard to swallow. Obviously, I was happy. It was my second time going to NCAAs with good results, going finishing third. That's awesome, but once it, when it's something that you, you vision yourself, uh, you know that you're capable of winning it, uh, it was just, it was hard. And so the, the year after, it was just the whole year. And Chris helped me so much with that, to stay focused every day, to, to, to work towards that goal. And going to that meet, I, I already had the fastest year, the fastest times all year. And it was, it was a decision, like you said, uh, it was a decision to, that I was going to win no matter what. But there were a few, one thing that it helped me mentally to get even stronger and, uh, and, and the vision that I was going to win, it was a lot more clear. So not many people know this. So I had a plan. I was going to, I told Arthur and, and Chris that prelims, I'm, I was just going to swim to make it back. They, I was the last heat, so I could see everyone, they, everybody have swam before, and coaches just told me, you just swim to win the heat, the heat, and you'll be good to move on. Try to just just manage your, your race and all that. <laughs> and uh, I did. I won the heat, and it was very close between me and Dax Hill. I qualify lane one. He qualified qualify lane eight and uh i always i almost gave him my coaches a heart attack because <laughs> i was so close to not <laughs> to not make it back and um so i went the, ra the race it felt good i think i swam like 133 something uh to on prelims and it felt good it felt like easy because it was just like uh, my goal was to go to break the record uh so going 133, it was it was it was something very manageable. So I'm walking back to the locker room and I see Dax Hill, the guy from Texas that year that won the year before, and he was throwing up. I was like, man, I feel good. This is if he's 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 the my main competitor, he's not feeling good. I got this. And that that moment it was just 
my ego just <laughs> elevated so much. <laughs> that was like, there was no question. And uh, I knew that nobody would see me because I'm a lane one and uh, I'm so out of the radar. And my decision was to go out fast and see how it feels. I was, I always, I had a plan going out uh, strong the first hundred and I had was, I knew that I, I believed that my training was really good. I, I, I knew that I could hold it back the last hundred. And uh, so I just took out fast. And uh, at that time it was something pretty fast, like going out 43 something or 42 high. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. And uh, I was so ahead of everyone else that I, in my mind, I was just like, okay, you just gotta, you just gotta touch it first. You just gotta finish, just gotta finish. And uh, I won, And uh, but going it before, I know it might sound cocky, but whatever, uh, I, I knew I was gonna win. I was, it was a decision before that uh, it was, it was my race, that was my year. And uh, nobody could take that from me. I like that actually the the fact that you said it was a decision because you you do I, a lot of the times when you perform at your highest level you decide to perform like that it's not a matter of chance or you're not you're not hoping that oh I hope I swim well today you actually at yeah. some point during the day decide today is my day they're not going to stop me today and uh it was it was definitely evident the way that you swam that race I knew it from the moment you took off that was it you you had decided uh you also had an amazing celebration you decided to clap with your feet instead of clapping with your hands how did you do that yeah yeah that was uh it started my the year before uh we were swimming against the uk university of kentucky and it was such a close meet uh they were ahead of us and we've been winning the previous years and uh, for, so, but that year was tough because they had a legit team. There was, they had really fast guys. And uh, you all came down to one race uh, that uh, the relay. So if we won, so we, I, so we end up splitting the relay. And uh, if we win the relay, we first and second, we would win the meet. And uh, obviously Louisville and Kentucky had such a big rivalry and uh, so I did at my at my junior year the foot clap at a dual meet and <laughs> the guy next to me, I don't know who who was it that anchored the relay with me, he just splashed water in my face and fuck you man, you cannot do this, such a disrespect. And I, I held it calm and like you try to like come up with a you know, try to come up with funny and it was like, man, next time just beat me. You know, I just uh <laughs> sorry for you. <laughs> and then <laughs> And then we got on deck and it had my guys, the guys on my team versus them. We started pushing each other. Like it was sort of like a drama show there. And yeah, it's just, uh, <laughs> it was, it was funny. And uh, we celebrate very hard at their pool. And when we were leaving, uh, they agged our bus and it was something, it was like, wow, this is, this is intense. This is, I like it. And uh, so <laughs> I did it because I thought it was, you know, try, I, I try to be different. Uh, try, I try to come up with something unique uh, people haven't done before. And uh, we're like, yeah, I mean, why not? <laughs> why one? I can do whatever I right know. You can and, do uh, whatever, man. Clap with your feet. You, when you win, you clap with your feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a classic <laughs> celebration. Definitely memorable. Um, we actually had a moment where, where I was coaching against you. I was, I was at Auburn and, and I had, um, supposedly the number one sprinter in the country in Marcelo Cherigini and, and you were, you were there as well in the, in the hundred bit. So we knew it was going to come down to, to you and him in Texas for the hundred freestyle title. But I certainly felt pretty confident that I had the best swimmer and, and the fastest man at the time. And that's not the way it ended up. You know, you ended up winning the race. Marcelo ends up getting second. I was devastated because I, I'm like you as a coach, you know, when, when they win, you win. And, you you all celebrate when they lose you lose and so you feel terrible but certainly it was just another one of those remarkable swims where you where you were just um you had a lot of confidence you were in control so talk me through that 100 freestyle championship win in texas right uh let me just uh briefly go back to the day before it was the 200 and uh i had won the year before and uh 
going to that race, I was just sort of managing. I was sort of afraid to lose the title that I had the year before. And, and it was just, I was just controlling everybody. I knew, uh, I knew so well how to race the two free that uh, the whole time that, that uh, I wanted to beat the record, but at the same time, I was so afraid to lose the title. So I was just managing the race to not let anybody pass me. Uh-huh. And Arthur, Arthur made a good point at that night. I was like, good job on the win. Uh, and I knew at that year I was faster. I was better prepared for that race. I wanted to beat the record. And he, but he said, made a good point. He was like, man, you didn't race. You didn't race to win. You just raced to not lose. And it was, it, that made total sense. That made total sense. And I slept on that. And I made a decision too that, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to take the hunter free. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go out. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to win this. And I have studied Marcelo swim before. I know he's, he is a faster, he was a faster guy. He still is a uh, faster swimmer than I am. And he mainly sprinter. He could have go out fast, but I made a, I sort of made a plan that if I, take out the first 15 ahead of him, have a good start, work on my underwaters, I'm going to shut him down uh, mentally because he will not expect that. And that's what I did. I, uh, I just had to give a extra push on the first 50, which is hard for me. Mainly as a dis- main, mid-distance swimmer, it is hard to take out fast. So it's something that I've been working on and I just, I just did. Uh, I took out ahead of him the first 50 and I knew that my back half was better than his so uh I could hold my strong better too and I worked a lot of underwater too so my last well I try to stay up a little longer not hit the waves and I end up winning nice I love that uh the fact that you you're making decisions to win and you had the confidence to win have you ever felt uh a meet internationally when you're representing Brazil where you've had that similar confidence or you've made similar decisions like that yeah Pen Ams Pen Ams was uh it was the same way uh I knew I was ready what year, to go what year was this 15 15 mm-hmm. uh and uh, I was lane seven too I was in the outside I like to be in the outside lanes where out of the radar I feel like being in the middle lane four or five it's so much pressure uh, I like to stay out of the radar. So going that year, I was the same thing. I was just, I had the plan to go out and race, execute. And I did exactly the way I visioned, the way I have been training, the way I have been visualizing the way, I, uh, how I was going to race. I was going to take the first hundred nice and smooth with coaches. Uh, we call that the stroke, sexy, sexy stroke, which is, you know, nice and big and uh control good legs but not overdoing it and and going finishing the first hundred i just attacked the wall and had a really good dolphin kicks and pushed the third third 50 where people start start dying i was just made my move and i got such a big lead and then the last 50 was just okay gotta put a head back head in and just let your emotions take control now. It's just, you see, you know that you're ahead. Just, once you have just the emotions, you, you forget about where it hurts, uh, what's going on. And you just so worry about touching first. And sometimes even the, the stroke collapse a little bit because you see, the emotions is dri- it's what's driving you. So I ended up winning the, the, the Pan American Games too. Uh, I broke the record and... I went 146.4, which is still my my life, my best time at the mm. 200. And it was it was such a fun race too. Listen, man, very few people will ever get to experience the feeling of having a an Olympics at home. You know, I I was very fortunate in the year 2000. I got to swim at Sydney, um, but it was it was a tough experience for me, honestly. Um, you swam in 16 in Rio. Talk to me about maybe um, the first time you heard that the Olympics were going to be in Brazil and then, you know, how that 
how that shifted over time and then eventually making the Brazilian team for the Olympics and what that experience was like? Oh man, it was, uh, it was awesome. He's just, uh, I think as an athlete, it's not many athletes get to go. Everybody envisioned themselves going to the Olympics, which is something I grew up, uh, you know, wanted to, to go to Olympics and, but I never, never thought, you know, it would, the Olympics would be in my backyard and, and it was the best experience as, as an athlete. It was really, really cool to sort of for the first time as, as, as a swimmer, you feel like I was compared to a soccer player back there because everybody, whoever was in the, wearing Brazil shirt, people would go crazy for you. People would just, you know, you could sort of manipulate the crowd. And, uh, and so it was so intense being able to just walk into the arena because it was, that, that pool was really cool, uh, surrounded by uh, stands all around. And it was loud in there and, uh, you know, sort of having an re immediate response. Whenever you wave to, to the crowd and then people would just get so enthusiastic and like ah, vibrate even more. Uh, it was such a, such a cool experience. And swimming in the final, obviously, we ended up being fifth on the relay. But uh, it was still like one of the best uh, memories uh, from as a swimmer. Even though it was hard to swallow, we... we, we we thought we would, we could get on the podium, but it was a, uh, it was still, I was so happy with my swim, the way how it was a show. It was, for me, it was like, it was such a show to, to, to be part of it. And it was really nice. Everything ended up so, so nice there. Did you feel a different type of pressure? Did you feel an, uh, an obligation where you felt like you had to get on the podium or did you, were you able to use that? crowd and that pressure as as a positive for your performance yeah i did feel a pressure on it especially because uh the the olympic the the brazilian uh, olympic committee had invested so much in the athletes you know we've been doing training camps we have done things that we never did before and and i, I sort of felt like i i needed to win to sort of give it back to the country to give it back to people and I feel like in Brazil, we, we, we do have a lack of idols. Uh, for me, the biggest idol we ever had, and until today, it might be uh, Ayrton Senna, the F1 mm -hmm. driver back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a reality. So, there, so And his reality was so far from the reality that the, the population lived in Brazil. And, uh, and I sort of wanted to give like, hope to, 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 to Brazil the last Olympic gold medals we had was Caesar, uh, you know, and it was amazing how much that impacted the, in people, how much, how many kids started enjoying, uh, uh, joining more swimming. And sort of, I wanted to feel the same way. I wanted to give back. I wanted to have sort of impact for not just for my team that was there, but for the whole country. I wanted to to give it back sort of like that sense of hope. Oh, you know, we can do this. We can, we can do this together. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's cool, man. That's very awesome in terms of the, the responsibility. And, and I guess in a way, as a person that wants to give back, I'm sure you, you feel a responsibility now as, as a coach or somebody as an influencer in Brazilian swimming, how can you affect the future of Brazilian swimming, especially now through this pandemic. And, you know, I understand that the clubs are being hit very hard. I'm sure that the swimmers back home are being uh, hit very hard. The, the whole sport itself, um, you know, is there a way that you felt like, hey, I've got to somehow give back to the future of Brazilian swimming? Yeah, there is a way, obviously. I think one of the ways it's just breaking the mentality that swimming is an individual sport because a lot of times we we limit ourselves. We don't give ourselves enough credit because we're just doing it for us. And uh, once once we bring the mentality of uh, doing collective, doing it as a team, and uh, making and people joining some of the teams to feel welcoming, to feel that they belong to certain to certain you know uh, to that club or to whatever they wearing it, and start doing for for others. 
it's such a like you it had so much value when you're doing something for others instead of when you're just doing it for yourself mm-hmm. and uh, i think just bringing that mentality that swimming it's not it's not individual sport uh even though if you don't do relays it's still not individual sport look at how many people that helps you out throughout the way so you have coaches you have masseuse therapists you have pts you have mom and dad which is part of it's a huge part of the team as well uh friends it, it's so many people that are involved you know getting to to that place where you you, you wanted to be and it's it's not even though you're just doing your own race it's you got to have more people so it's just people have having i think once people start having this understanding that uh it is a team sport people who who achieve more success too do you have and, aspirations of being a brazilian coach in the future or or being part of the brazilian um confederacy or federation or anything like that yeah i'd love to to help brazil uh you know coaching uh, have a program down there but i feel like right now I want to learn as much as I can here and um uh, and have something ready to start there. Be not I don't want to sort of go down there and hustle and and sort of I feel like there's a lack of there's a lack of appreciation when you were a swim coach there and and I don't want to go through that. I want to I want to learn here as much as I can so whenever I go down there I have something solid to bring on and add on to 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 the program or to the country. Nice. Um had one of your teammates, Mallory Comerford on, she gave us a, an incredible 200 free set that she has done at Louisville and with your team before. Give me something else. Give me another set that you felt has uh has been a huge impact on you becoming, you know, one of the world's best 100 200 freestylers. Yeah, one of the sets I I think she mentioned about the 2150s uh-huh. uh right that said it's it's really good uh obviously it's it's one of the sets that y- you have to be prepared a couple of days before yeah. but one of the sets I like it a lot too it's uh it's the 2450s short course we do a view too sometimes when it, when we can we do a long course but 2450s straight uh view too and usually they are on 110 and you have to hold the best average there going fast as you can and uh it's something that obviously i have to also i i have to know that it's coming i have to be mentally prepared because it's a it's a hard set it's yeah. and i i like it a lot when Just you're at your best what are you holding 22s 22 short course 22 yards. lows yeah yeah, yeah. And then what about long course have you have you done it long course? I have 26 27. Yeah, good. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, and the one said I I like it a lot. I like I love uh training with Chris Lindauer. Uh he he was now he's the the sprinting he he coached the sprint program and uh he he I love it cuz he's always thinking outside of the box, come up with new things, new drills. and i loved you know uh training with him one thing i liked it a lot was tuesdays and thursdays we did uh, we call it the battle pool sometimes we short the the ball cats move it, move it close together and we just race uh short distance like sometimes not even push off we just go from a dead fish position into to to the wall or have to do a couple flips on the way so he always like was testing not much the swimming the swimming skills and ability to go fast but a lot of the workouts he put in you had to be an athlete you had to be very athletic and do other things that was non swimming so a lot of focus on push offs uh underwater breakouts some of the things that were not just the swimming itself uh just being very athletic and capable of doing all that together Who's somebody on the international scene that you really loved competing against? Um uh, Nathan Andrew, man. I was Nathan Andrew, even though he beat me every time. <laughs> but uh he was uh, he was someone that uh 
I really admire as a, you know, I always look up to him as a, as a the great athlete. He has been for so long in the, in, you know, on the top and he's such a cool guy too. He's just always with that big smile, always like helping, uh, especially the younger ones. He's never always giving his best to, 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 to his fans. And the other one who trained with me was Kelsey, Kelsey Dahlia. Uh, I never competed against her, but uh, as an international swimmer, uh, it's someone that I, uh, I look up for her so much. And I was able to train with her and learn so much from her as well. She, she was the woman that always, like, every practice, she was able to put me in my place. Sometimes when I, when I was not doing a good job, she, she would be the one, like, you know, being forward to me and just like being, being straight. It was like, Hey, you're not doing a good job or like what's going on. And she was, uh, and I love training with her. She was a, she was a great, great partner to train with. Awesome, man. Well, listen, I appreciate it. Congratulations on a great career. Thank you for being uh, one of my teammates for many years on the Brazilian team too. I learned a lot from you and got a, a lot of respect for you and uh, very proud of the man that you are right now. And um, can't wait to Thank be you. on the deck coaching with you so, someday soon, man. Thank you, man. It was a uh, it was amazing. Uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah, absolutely. All right, take care, buddy.